Remember when Richard Dawkins gave powerful arguments against the existence of God? Neither do I. Dawkins is one of the pioneering ringleaders of that circus we call the New Atheism. If you're not familiar with the group, the New Atheism is like the Old Atheism if the Old Atheism got rabies. Back in the 1980s and 1990s, atheists generally didn't care what other people believed. They were like, oh, if you think your God and your book help you, that's fine for you, but I don't need that. Then Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens came along and turned that cute little atheist puppy into Cujo. How did they do it? How did atheism go from Winnie the Pooh to Cocaine Bear almost overnight? Well, Dawkins and Harris and Hitchens were the first people to successfully use cult tactics on a large scale with atheists. Turns out, if you want to mobilize and weaponize your listeners, Arguments and evidence just aren't the way to go in the 21st century. Manipulating people into joining and expanding your group is massively more efficient and effective. Keep in mind, I'm not advocating manipulation and cult tactics. I'm simply describing the world we now live in. If you want a group that's going to march out into the world and mindlessly carry out your commands like drones, you need cult tactics. You instill in your followers an us-versus-everyone-else mentality. It's us against the world. You give them an unmerited self-esteem boost just for being in your group. In this case, it's, oh, if you're part of our group, you're smart. If you're not part of our group, you're dumb. You stir up their emotions and give them a sense of urgency. Oh, man, Christians are on the verge of forming a theocracy. If we don't stop this religion thing right now, we're all doomed. If you set up your group correctly, you can rely on peer pressure within the group to keep members in line. So if someone starts asking the wrong questions or doubting the group's doctrines, other members of the group will shame that person into conformity. The most crucial step for someone like Dawkins is convincing his followers to let him do their important thinking for them. If you run into a Dawkins drone on Twitter or in the comments section of YouTube, the Dawkins drone will tell you how stupid you are for believing in God. But if you start asking questions, you find out very quickly that the Dawkins drone has no clue what he's talking about. He doesn't know anything about biology or cosmology or history or philosophy or anything else that may be relevant to the discussion. In fact, there's a really good chance that the Dawkins drone who's trying to convince you to become an atheist, can't even spell the word atheist. I don't have any actual statistics, but I would estimate, based on personal encounters online, that between one quarter and one third of Dawkins drones can't spell the word atheist. But that won't stop them from telling you how stupid you are for not mindlessly siding with Richard Dawkins, the Zuckernike of atheism. Why are these Dawkins drones so confident that there's no evidence for the existence of God when they've clearly never examined the evidence for anything? Well, they really believe that their atheist heroes have carefully examined the evidence and concluded that the evidence is really, really bad. The vast majority of the new atheists that you'll encounter have never actually studied any of the arguments for theism. Instead, they have extremely devout, dare I say it, faith that their leaders have carefully thought through these issues for them. There's just one problem. The leaders of the new atheism haven't carefully considered the evidence and concluded that there's no evidence for the existence of God. They've done something far simpler and far more cult-like. They've constructed a methodology that is absolutely impervious to evidence. The actual evidence for God's existence is completely irrelevant to someone like Richard Dawkins because he's using a methodology that makes his ideology immune to evidence. Let me guess. You Dawkins fans don't believe me, do you? Can't trust a theist. We're not in your group. We're all dumb. Can't trust an outsider. Well, let's turn to someone you can trust. Richard Dawkins. You don't want to go against him, do you? Of course not. Think about what it would do to your self-esteem if you got kicked out of your group and you didn't get to sit around all day telling everyone else how stupid they are. 
That would be as traumatic as an Andrew Tate fan suddenly realizing that telling women they're inferior won't actually get him a Bugatti. In the clips we're about to watch, Peter Bogosian is interviewing Richard Dawkins. Bogosian is the author of A Manual for Creating Atheists, so you know he's going to be nodding in agreement at everything Dawkins says. But after these two atheists agree with each other that there just aren't any good arguments for belief in God, Bogosian gets hypothetical. Suppose God did exist. What sort of evidence could God give Dawkins that could convince Dawkins to believe in God? Given that the host of arguments don't work, what, what would it take for you to believe in God? What would it take? And as we're about to see, they're talking about what it would take if theism were true. If God exists, how could he convince Richard Dawkins that he exists? Well, I used to say uh, it would be very simple. It would be, uh, you know, the second coming of Jesus or, or a great big, deep, booming bass Paul Robeson voice um, uh, saying, I am God and, and, and I created. So he used to say, that the second coming of Jesus or an audible voice from God would convince him. But then he realized that these things wouldn't convince him at all. I was persuaded mostly by actually uh, Steve Zara, who's a, who's a regular contributor to my website, richarddawkins.net. He more or less persuaded me that if you, even if there was this, this booming voice and the second coming in clouds of glory, the more probable explanation is that it's a hallucination or... Right. <laughs> conjuring trick by David Copperfield or right. something. Um, Notice, if God did speak, and if Jesus did return, coming on the clouds of heaven with legions of angels, Dawkins still wouldn't believe in God. Because a more probable explanation to him would be that it's all a hallucination or a magic trick. But they're not finished. So if you, you know, if you walked out and there were these globes that were spinning around that said, you know, I am God, believe in me, or the famous Krauss thing, you walk out into the sky and it spells out in the stars in different languages, I am God, believe in me. So now we walk outside and we see a message written in the stars. The stars have been rearranged so that they spell out, I am God, believe in me, in multiple languages. Surely that would convince these guys who always go where the evidence points, right? Well, again, the problem is it could be a delusion, but the other problem is you'd have to rule out alternative explanations. So there could be other explanations for why a message about God was written in the stars. You'd have to rule out alternative explanations, like the aliens. I mean, you'd have to... How could you rule out, well, I mean, there could be an alien trickster culture or something. Huh? We're going to get those little humans. Maybe powerful alien tricksters wrote the message in the stars as part of a cosmic prank. So Clark's third law, um, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, magic being super, supernatural. The Clark from Clark's third law is Arthur C. Clark, the man who wrote 2001, A Space Odyssey. Clark's third law states that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Dawkins gives an example. If you were to, if you were to fly a Boeing 747 back to the Middle Ages, um, you would be greeted as God. Now, what's your point, Richard? An, an alien visitation. Any, any aliens who could actually visit us would have to be so far beyond us in their technology that they probably could manipulate the stars to, to um, spell out words or geometric forms or something of that so sort. Aliens that are powerful enough to reach us could also be powerful enough to write out words in the stars. So if we all walked outside one day and we read, I am God, believe in me, written in the stars in multiple languages, we should definitely not believe in God because that message could have been written by alien tricksters. So, God audibly speaking to Dawkins wouldn't convince him. Jesus appearing at his second coming wouldn't convince him. God writing a message in the stars wouldn't convince him. What would convince him? So that couldn't be enough. So, it, so what, would, what would persuade you? Well, I'm starting to think nothing would. Uh... Nothing would. 
Even if God showed up and started blasting people with lightning bolts, that still wouldn't convince Dawkins that God exists. And if you listen to the discussion, it sounds like Peter Bogosian agrees completely. If God exists, there is absolutely nothing he can do to convince Richard Dawkins and Peter Bogosian that he exists. Why? Because they've adopted a methodology that is completely impervious to evidence. But there's more. Well, I'm starting to think nothing would, uh, which, which, is, which in, in a way goes against the grain, because I've always paid lip service to the view that a scientist should change his mind when evidence is forthcoming. Did you catch that? Dawkins says that he's always paid lip service to the view that a scientist should change his mind in light of the evidence. He calls it lip service. Do you know what lip service means? It means you say one thing, but your actions show that you don't really believe what you're saying. So, for all his talk about going where the evidence points, he admits that when it comes to the existence of God, evidence is irrelevant. Because I've always paid lip service to the view that a scientist should change his mind when evidence is forthcoming. The trouble is I can't think what that evidence would look like. Isn't that interesting? According to Richard Dawkins, not according to me, according to Richard Dawkins, he will reject any evidence for God's existence. If God speaks to him directly, well, that could be a hallucination. If Jesus returns in the clouds, well, that could be a magic trick. If God writes a message in the stars in multiple languages, well, that could be alien tricksters trying to trick me. Notice, the guy who has dedicated his life to telling people that there are no good arguments for the existence of God is the same guy who admits that he will automatically reject any argument for God's existence no matter how strong the evidence is. The leaders of the new atheism haven't examined the evidence for God's existence and gone where the evidence points. They've set up a methodology that is impervious to evidence for anything they don't want to believe. My goodness, if we wanted to play by these rules, we could just say that the new atheists don't exist. But David, of course the new atheists exist. We just watched some clips of Richard Dawkins and Peter Bogosian. What if we were hallucinating? What if this is a David Blaine magic trick? What if alien tricksters want us to think we just saw Peter Bogosian interviewing Richard Dawkins? What if, what if, what if? Playing skeptic is easy, my friends. Now, we've heard Clark's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I'm ready to lay down Wood's first law. Here it is. If you're going to reject an argument, no matter how good or bad the argument is, then the fact that you reject the argument tells us absolutely nothing about whether the argument is good or bad. If you're going to reject an argument, no matter how good or bad the argument is, then the fact that you reject the argument tells us absolutely nothing about whether the argument is good or bad. In other words, Dawkins rejects all arguments for the existence of God. What does that tell us about how good or bad these arguments for the existence of God are? Absolutely nothing, because Dawkins has admitted that he will reject any evidence, no matter how strong it is. If God speaks to him, Dawkins won't believe in God. If Jesus returns with a chorus of angels, Dawkins won't believe in God. If God writes a message in the stars, Dawkins won't believe in God. No matter what the evidence is, Dawkins won't believe in God. He admitted it. So, when Dawkins declares that there's no evidence for God's existence, does that tell us anything, anything whatsoever, about whether there's evidence for God's existence? No. And yet, this is one of the guys whose followers trust him to do their deep thinking for them. Of course, if you explain this to them, they'll deny it. People who've been manipulated and conditioned with cult tactics usually don't realize they've been manipulated and conditioned. So, when you show them what's happened to them, don't expect them to thank you for exposing the leader of their group. Keep in mind, 
I'm not talking about all atheists here. I'm referring to the ones who've been programmed, like bots, to run around screaming, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, show me the evidence, that's no evidence, that's no evidence, that's no evidence. It's their mantra. And it's incredibly difficult to get them to see how their thoughts and behavior have been conditioned, because now their self-esteem is connected to their membership in their group. Turns out that sitting at your computer all day telling people they're stupid because they're not in your group does give you an easy self-esteem boost. So criticizing their group is an attack on the source of their worth and value, and this makes it extremely difficult to show them how they've been manipulated. Notice I said difficult, not impossible. Cult tactics can be undermined and exposed. And I'm about to show you how. <laughs>